the judgments like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I seem to get over this? Because I've never experienced anything like this. How come I can't seem to bounce back from this? How come I can't get it together? And sometimes those kind of things, in addition to just the depression, really make it tough for them to keep on, uh, keep going and stay positive. So that's how I decided to approach the coping skills tonight. I want to talk about stress. You guys have you ever used the word stress before? <laughs> Almost on a daily basis, right? My guess is that most of us use stress at least once a day to describe something. So what is stress? It's a really common definition is to say it's when demands are greater than resources. So let's say, for example, that I was experiencing financial stress. What does that mean? No money? <laughs> Right, so I have more bills than I have money to pay for, right? So that's a pretty common one that I think most people experience, at least at some point in life, sometimes throughout our whole lives. Okay? Uh, what about like, like physical stress on your body? What would be an example of that? You yeah. can't lift something that's too heavy for you. All right, so you try to lift something that you just can't, you don't have the muscles to lift, and you might see like a back injury or something like that. But this is when you see people in their mid-30s trying to play basketball like they were 17 and they end up at the doctor with a torn ligament or something like that. Okay? Because the resources they're placing on their body is, are not, I mean the demands they're placing on their body are just not, are too much for the resources that they have. So, <clears throat> is it possible to have something like emotional stress? Give me an example of that. Losing, losing a family member. Okay? Right? So if you lose someone close to you through death, especially if it's by accident or really unexpected, that places a really big emotional toll on us. It's not like we have the resources to just deal with that. That's why you won't see people very often, let's say they lose a close family member to death, you won't see them just get up the next day and go to work like nothing ever happened. They take some time off. Why? Yeah. Because they need their resources to deal with the tragic loss. They don't have the resources to just keep going as usual. What about cognitive stress? You know what cognitive refers to? The idea of thoughts or thinking? What would be an example of cognitive stress? OCD. OCD? <laughs> yeah, right? Demanding much more of your brain than your brain's ready to deal with, right? Overthinking? Yeah, yeah. So let's say that you. Uh, Decide you're going to get a certification, you need to pass a certain exam, and uh, you have to study, study, study to memorize all this stuff. Your brain may not be as uh, uh, rested and ready to do other things like balance a checkbook, or uh, think through something, or be patient with a coworker because it's taking so much out of us. But our, our bodies are built to handle stress, <clears throat> and we have sometimes more resources than we think. But it can be tough if the stress is persistent. Uh, and this is what we're finding with a lot of the veterans coming back from the wars in the Middle East. Um, is that they're being exposed not to just one stressful incident, but there's a persistent level of stress. Because they're walking around in constant fear of something like an imp improvised explosive device. Or an insurgent dressed as a civilian. And they're just constantly in that hyper-stress mode, and eventually it starts to wear us out. Um, just like we would if we spent, you know, all month studying for a test, eventually we just start to burn out a little bit. And so it's important to develop some skills to help manage or cope with the stress so that we can kind of bring our resources back up. It's kind of like putting gas in the tank or letting your batteries charge. You guys all know the feeling when your smartphone runs out of batteries, right? You see this at the airport all the time, these people desperately running to plug their phone into the wall. It's what it can be like. You need to kind of recharge a little bit. So I'm going to talk, talk this through a little bit. What do you think? Does OCD cause stress? Okay. So I know we have some people here that struggle with OCD, family members, friends. So let's talk about that. What kind of stress does OCD cause? We know the specific symptoms of it, what it does directly, but what are some of the side effects? What are the stresses that it can cause? Anxiety. Anxiety? Depression. Depression. 
Anger? Exhaustion. Exhaustion. Somebody over here said anger. Okay. Uh, frustration. Frustration. Yep. Messes up relationships. Okay. What kind of effect can it have on relationships? Big. <laughs> yep. It's hard to live with somebody who's really <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What other stresses result from OCD? Loss of time. Time loss, right? All the time spent engaging in the rituals or the compulsions or avoiding staying away from things. Time spent preparing for treatment, thinking about treatment, that kind of stuff. What else? Aging. Okay. What other consequences? Having isolation. Ah. Yeah, that's a good. Can you see how a lot of all these things we're talking about can take a toll on us? There are demands that are placed upon us that we may or may not have enough resources to deal with, especially if they persist. And we really need to be able to fill up our tank a little bit uh, so we can stay strong. I have a, a friend. Um, whose husband uh, has, has, has a traumatic brain injury. And I've watched her um, try to care for him, but not fill up her own tank. And it's really starting to take its toll. It's been four years now. And uh, she, both physically and mentally, she's just running out of gas. And she can't be there to help. For those of you that are struggling with OCD, and especially if you've been involved in treatment, you know it takes a lot of juice to stick with the treatment. You've got to have a lot of energy, you've got to rebuild the motivation in order to stick with it. So coming up with ways to fill up the tank is the idea. Here's a few things I thought of. Uh, I think you got most of these. Let's talk about that first one, though. What's, what's stigma? You heard that word before? Right, right. So, here's a great example of stigma. Let's say you have a job, you go skiing on the weekend, and uh, you, you blow your knee out. And you need to call your boss on Monday and say, I can't be there. Do you have any, any question about whether or not you're going to tell them that you blew your knee out? No. It's like, well, I don't think anybody would worry about that. Let's say you're going through the weekend and you have a really bad OCD episode, a really bad depressive episode, and you just can't make it into work on Monday. Is there a hesitation about telling your boss? And that's stigma. It's not fair. And I think there's a lot of things like this lecture series that are doing everything they can to help reduce stigma, but it exists. But it adds a stress because you have to sit there when you're really struggling and not only deal with your struggles, but to worry about what everybody thinks about your struggles. And sometimes, in reality, if it's really going to affect your job, if, if employers know about it, or friends know about it, are you going to lose your friend? Or are you going to lose your job? Um, I'm a hairstylist, and I came for eight weeks after treatment over here, treatment center over here. It was the best thing I ever did. Oh, and the thing, well, my clients said, well, what are they, they must be wondering why I'm going to the beach, or I'm going to, you know what, I found that after I came back, and I was more comfortable talking about it, that they understood, they, you know, it helped, it helped, plus I work with other women, and them helping me through the whole thing, and just being able to talk to my clients, you know, they knew, yeah. they, they knew something. <laughs> Thank, you. I Thank you for sharing that. And I want, I want to point out the stress part there, which was while you were in treatment, you worried for weeks, about what, what are they going to think? That's an additional demand additional stressor that kind of comes as an extra on top of the OCD. It's not like OCD is enough. You've got to have all these extras to get added up on top of it. So I want to see if I can help cope with some of these extras so you can keep the focus on the problem and really take care of business. Uh, what else? Think about some of these last three. The stressors of finding the treatment. Well, somebody who's available, Somebody that you can pay for, somebody that knows how to deal with OCD, somebody that knows what it is. That would be a big stressor. One of the reasons why this lecture series is in place. What did you talk about in September? Yep. So <clears throat> that's a big one. 
for those of you that have been through or are going through treatment, does that come with stressors? Yeah? And then sometimes it comes back. We have these things called lapses or relapse. And that can bring a little bit of stress. Or sometimes just the worry about what if it, what if it comes back. And that can be a stress that takes a big toll. So let's talk about stress versus a stressor. What do you think the difference is? Stress or causes stress. Yeah. I think that's a key thing to, to help realize is that <clears throat> a stressor is the thing that causes the stress. The stress is what we experience because of that. Why is it important to see the difference between those things? Which one do you have control over? Well, she says, I don't know now. The stress? Well, at least we hope so, right? At least that's why we're here. But do we always have control over the stressor? No. So stressor are the things that happen often from the outside or sometimes the things that happen on the inside. We don't have a lot of control over them, but the stress is our response to them. And that's where we're going to do our work, is responding to stressors. There's not much I can do to send you out of the door tonight so that you never have another stressor. But I can hopefully give you a few things to help you respond better to stressors when they happen, so that your stress is manageable, um, and, and it doesn't persist in a way that just drains all your batteries. What about this word, coping? What do you think of when, when you see that word? Yeah, that's what I that's what I come to mind. Just dealing with things. How do you deal with things? What else can you come up with? Just keeping going despite the stress. Okay. Okay. So keeping going despite the stress. So it, it implies that we're somehow able to do something to to keep moving. What else? What else does coping refer to? Adjusting. Adjusting. So in that, there's like something active that we do to kind of say, you know what, my tank is low. I need to fill it up a little bit. I need to do something about it. Or maybe we, we soothe ourselves a little bit. Uh, when you've had a long day, anybody just settle down in front of a TV show to just kind of veg a little bit? What are you doing there? Now, I suppose if you ask your first grade teacher, she's going to say, you're wasting your life away, right? <laughs> but what are you really doing there? Relaxing. Relaxing? Refueling? Coping? Soothing a little bit? Uh, some people like to listen to music. Um, eating may not always have the best outcomes. Uh, but everybody does it once in a while. A little bowl of ice cream can help soothe a little bit. Because what does it do? It helps refuel the tank, minimize the impact of the stress, uh, relax a little bit. A lot of people will exercise when they're stressed. This is coping. It's this idea of taking an active approach to dealing with stress when it comes, and not just kind of hoping that it just goes away, but being active about it. Now let's talk about this, this skill work. What do you think of when you hear the word skill? What's that? Strategy. A strategy, okay. Something you have to practice. Something you have to practice. And even before you practice, is it something you that you learn? It, yeah. You learn. Yeah. And then before you learn it, you have to say, you know what, I need this. I want this in my life. What are some examples of skills that we try to develop? Just think big picture here. Centering. Okay, centering skills. Confidence. Say that again? Confidence. Confidence. Even bigger than just psychological stuff. What kind of skills do people develop? Drawing. Cooking. cooking. Anybody ever taken a cooking class? Or watch the cooking show to try to develop cooking skills? Okay, what other skills do you have? Drawing. Drawing? Art? Anybody ever taken piano lessons? Yeah. This is my son. That's the play game. And I watch TV. You see this is a skill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting into that fast. <laughs> Video games are skills. I can see that. Could be a coping thing too, right? Driving, right? Some of us have better than others. Ninja skills. Right? Athletic. Athletic skills. 
singing, public speaking skills. Sometimes people are really good at making friends, talking to people. Uh, if you have work, you have a certain, have a certain skill set that you need. And I want you to think about what you did to develop those skills, how there was this intentional plan to get good at this. It came from practice and implementing these things as something you do proactively. If you ever decided you want to be a better cook, you go out there and take a cooking class, read a book, watch some cooking shows, and cook lots of stuff. So that's the same thing if you think about these coping skills. They're things that you can be more intentional about, that you can be proactive to apply in your life. So let's talk about coping skills. I'm only going to give you two, um, two big ones. First, this idea of letting go. Anybody heard that before? Just let it go. Or here's my dad. Just relax. <laughs> right? How does that work? Don't worry about it. You ever heard that before? Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. How does it work? Yeah, but then you also hear sometimes of people that say, I, I just learned how to let it go, and you say, well, how did they do that? And what in the world are they letting go of? Maybe that's the big trick in trying to figure out how to make this work. So let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, I need a volunteer to do something that has the potential to be a little embarrassing. <laughs> it's kind of like when your friends say, here, try this, this is gross. I'll do it. You'll do it? Okay, have a seat. And can I have one of your handouts? Yeah. Does it matter what you want? Nope. Okay. All right. I'm going to give you this. And uh, let's say that this, is, this represents some work that you have to do. Maybe it's an uh, important document you need to review and read or something like that. But. Uh, you're stressed. You've got lots of stressors going on. I'm nervous. I'm in front of all these people. That's enough stress. Yeah. I warned him it was going to be embarrassing. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to matter though. He's still stressed, right? Anyway, this, this paper right here represents stress. Okay? So what we're going to try is a few different strategies for re responding to stress. We're going to try three. And see how effective each one is. Um, and well, and what's your name? Rob. Rob. We're going to ask Rob how well he's doing in, in, in terms of reading his documents and see if, it's, if he's able to focus on his documents as he tries each of these strategies, okay? So it's really important you pay close attention to details when you're like proofing, looking at details, making sure the document says just what it needs to say. And here comes the stress. And the, the deal is, is you realize the stress is going to get me and I don't want it to get me because it's going to mess up your day. So as the stress comes, you need to do whatever you need to do so it doesn't touch you. You're welcome to get up and run around. <laughs> just don't jump out the window. <laughs> okay, so as it comes, go ahead and do it. And, and the more you act on this, the better point this is going to make. Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay, get up and run or else it's going to get you. Go. Go. It's not going to do it? I have no, I have no ability to read. This right now. Right. So I'm gonna leave. Okay. <laughs> See? How's it going? Not very well. What's he Because I can't read and walk at the same time. <laughs> okay. And what are you focused on? Uh, I'm, I'm not focused on anything right now. Right. But really the main purpose was to what? Did you read your document? I know it has three paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> they had more than three paragraphs, but I was trying to read the third paragraph, but yeah. I have no idea what's in the first two paragraphs. So, you guys relate to that a little bit? It's called the escape strategy, which is you see something bad coming down the road and you try to run from it. And it works temporarily because you do get away from it. But what happens to what you're trying to do? And how's your focus on the task at hand? Right? Let's say that it's not a document. Let's say you're sitting there trying to have a lunch with a friend and you really just want to be able to talk to them. But here comes some stress. And what do you try to do? You try to run from it. How focused are you on your friend? Okay. Have you ever had that experience where they're sitting there talking to you and you realize all of a sudden they just said a bunch of things. I have no idea what they just said. 
Have you ever been talking to someone else when they did that to you? Yeah. <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> that's strategy number one, escape. The problem with it is that uh, it takes all of our focus and a lot of energy. Because you end up walking around, running around, whatever you can, and ultimately it catches up with you. So, let's say you say, you know what, that's not going to work. I'm going to fight back this time. When that stress shows up, I'm going to push back because I want to get my job done. I want to be here with my friend. I want to do whatever. So this time you're going to try to read. And as I bring a stress to you, you're going to put up your right hand and you're going to push back. Okay? You ready? Go ahead and push back. Keep reading. Keep focused. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, how's the reading going? It was going better that time. Better that time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, how much focus did you have on the document? Much more than the first. Much more than the much first. Than the first so he's fighting back, but how much energy was it take, taking to fight? It, it was like I was spending half my energy reading and half my energy yeah, trying to push you away, as opposed to when I was running away from you. I was having to manage walking. I was having to manage where I was going. I was having to manage what I felt like walking through the crowd, yep. making more of a scene, as opposed to this felt, I felt like I was more in control. Sounds like he's thinking this is better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. At least you're getting half your energy, right? How long do you think you can keep that up? Not long. Okay. Your arm starts, your arm starts to get tired, right? I only, I didn't have a whole lot of energy to focus on what I was doing. Yeah. Let's say that this is really tough, and you need two or three hours to do it. Remember that phrase burnout? And what did this guy say back here earlier? Exhausting. Exhausting. I think that's what happens sometimes. Is because hey. sometimes we're not only just fighting the OCD or fighting whatever is in our life, we're fighting off all these other things, and it takes a toll on us. And yeah, it's good to fight, but it wears us out. So let's try. Let's try a third strategy. Okay. Uh, this time, I want you to focus on reading, but as the stress comes, just go ahead and set it on your lap, and then focus on reading. And then I'll just uh, sit here for a minute. So as he reads, what do you notice is different? Calm. He's calm. What else? He's reading. Oh, reading. <laughs> what else do you notice? He's not fighting. Not fighting. Hey, okay. is the stress still there? Yep. Here's the big question: Was the stress there all three times? Yeah. Yeah. That's the big thing to catch: is to realize that no matter the response, the stress was there. Whether it was following him around the room, whether he was pushing back, or whether he's just sitting there not struggling with it. In all three cases, the stress stays there. What, so the stressor stays the same, but what, what changes in this third one? His response to it. And how is his response different in the third time compared to the first two? Okay. Yeah. Now, it's possible that that stressor could still bring some discomfort. In fact, I bet it does. So it's not like it's complete, calm, transcendent peace or anything like that. But what's missing is the struggle. Because if you notice what caused a lot of the problems in the first two was not the stressor itself, the paper, it was the way he responded to it. It's hard to read when you're running around the room. It's also hard to read when you're fighting back like this. But at least with this, there's, a, there's, there's less of a response on our part. It's almost like saying, Maybe the best way to respond to it is by doing nothing. Because sometimes by doing a lot, we just end up struggling with it more. So when I use that phrase, letting go, we're not necessarily letting go of the stress. We're letting go of what? The struggle against it. So there's a personality psychologist a long time ago said, it's not stress that kills us, it's our response to it.
please. Yeah. How do you let go of the, the struggle of it's consuming your brain so much and it's just there all the time? I mean, do you take deep breaths? Do you meditate? Do you know what I'm trying to ask you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the key thing to realize is that the paper is there all the time when you let go of the struggle. It's not like the stress goes away. Or the thoughts. But it's what we add. So the first step here is to at least get rid of what we add to it. There's still a weight that we have to carry here that makes it tough. But at least we let go of the extra stuff that we add to it. Hang on tight. I think you'll see more of what okay. we're talking about here. Okay. So now your experience. How is that different? Uh, it, when I put the paper in my lap, the paper disappeared. The stress was actually you talking. Because I, <laughs> I still couldn't concentrate on something else. And I was part of the conversation, so I was hearing you. Got it. Got it. <clears throat> was, there, was there more energy to focus on? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That works. Here you go, you can take the stress too. <laughs> so, thank you for your help. Hey, so your question is a good one. Keep it on your mind, because that's what I want to try to answer. Okay. But the, thing, the key thing to realize is that the stress stays there no matter what. This is where people will get stuck, is they're thinking, okay, I need to let go, but it's not going anywhere. I still have the stress, and it's not working. That's, it's, it's, it's meant to decrease the extra that we add on top of it by responding, but it doesn't always take away that initial load. That's still heavy, that's still tough. It's this idea of, this is the stress, and it's heavy. It's hard to carry sometimes. But sometimes the way we respond to it makes it much bigger. Okay? So this is a Buddhist saying, that I adapt a little bit. The Buddha is saying is this idea that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Have you heard this? This idea that pain in life can be expected, but sometimes the way that we respond to pain can increase our suffering ten, a hundred, a thousand fold. A classic example is alcoholism. So let's take a, a classic case. A man in his mid-forties had a rough childhood of abuse, uh, poor relationship with his parents, several divorces, kids that don't like him. He's got a lot of pain that he's dealing with. So what does he do to get rid of the pain? Drinks. Eh? Drinks until it goes away. So he's trying to get rid of this stuff in the middle. But what does alcoholism bring? More pain. More suffering. Because not only is he, the pain comes back as soon as he sobers up, but when he sobers up he realizes that now he maybe has a DUI. Now he's maybe lost his job. Now his kids really don't like him. They've lost respect for him. The relationship that he did have that was somewhat positive, they can't bear to be with him anymore because they can't watch him destroy himself. So it's this idea that not being able to handle the small circle who gets the big one. This, and that's the irony. Is all he was trying to do was to get rid of the, the, the middle. But he ended up with hundredfold in terms of suffering. That's the Buddhist idea. Pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. So we adapt a little bit for stress. The stress is inevitable in life. Can we agree on that part? But perhaps the freaking out could be optional. And when I say freaking out, that's things like, here comes the stress, but I'm running all over the room. Or here comes the stress, but I'm just fighting back, but I can't really focus on what I'm doing. I do a lot of work with people on test anxiety. This is really where this will show up. Somebody's sitting there trying to take a test. They come to a question they don't know, and what do they do? Panic. What kind of thoughts show up? I'm going to fail. fail. I'm going to fail this class, which means I'm never going to graduate, which means I'm never going to get a good job, and I'm going to be living on the streets. And then they freak out, and for the rest of the testing session, they're in freak-out mode, and they cannot focus on the test. And so one of the interventions we'll often do is say, you've got to make room for some anxiety or some stress to show up during the test. But don't turn it into a freak out. And that's their problem is they think, for me to get through a test successfully, I have to have no anxiety. And then as soon as the anxiety shows up, they freak out. And sometimes that's what happens for us. We think, I just got to make it through the day. If it's a good day, as long as I have no stress. 
But then when stress starts to show up, panic mode, freak out, the day's shot. It's totally ruined. It's this idea of making room for stress, but letting go of the freak out part. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what are we letting go of? Okay. The freaking out, the struggles, the responses. Not necessarily the stress. And that's probably why it annoys us so much when people say, just let it go. Because I think we often assume that we just need to let go of the stress. Which means we don't have it anymore. Yeah, the stress comes, you just let it go. As though there's some kind of magic thing that you're holding on to it. But that's not necessarily what we're talking about here. It's this idea of letting go of our struggle against it. Maybe we can learn to hold this part. But this one starts to become too overwhelming to carry. So, uh, two days ago, I was in Washington, D.C. on vacation. And I was walking through the National Mall on Sunday. And it was snowing, <laughs> sleeting. I'm there with my three little kids, nine, six, three. And we're trying to have a nice vacation. It was a great time, but it was rain. And we were trying to walk from one museum to the other. And I don't know if you've been to Washington, D.C., but everything looks close on the map. <laughs> when you're not on the real ground, it's a long ways away to those things. And so here we are walking across the National Mall see the Washington Memorial over here, the Capitol over here, and it's raining, and it's cold, it's about 40 degrees, and I find myself going like this. And I'm holding my three-year-old like this, and we're all scrunched up. You know what I'm talking about? When it rains, you do that? Why do we do that? Try to stay dry. <laughs> to try to stay dry? Does it do anything? No. <laughs> So I'm halfway across the mall, and this is a long walk, and I, my arms start to cramp up. And my neck is about to die, and my, I can't barely hold on to my daughter, and I'm thinking, why am I doing this? Is it helping me stay dry in any way? No. But sometimes we, we kind of, the way we respond to something is we'll fight back, we'll tense up, as though it has some kind of effect. But in reality, whether I'm doing this, or whether I'm doing this, I'm getting the wet. Either way. And that's a tricky thing to realize. If you want to practice this, luckily we're in Massachusetts and it's the springtime. You can probably try this tomorrow. <laughs> Next time it rains, I really would like you to try this. I want you to go out there without an umbrella and notice yourself tensing up and how you respond to that rain. And then practice letting go of the struggle against it. You're still going to get wet. You're still going to have that stuff in the middle. But the way you're responding to it is very different. It's a lot easier for me to walk, however what far it was across the mall, to the other museum like this than it was when I was like this. Because there was so much tension in me trying not to get wet, but it was not doing me any good. So, <clears throat> whenever it rains next, really, <laughs> your friends or family are going to think you're silly, but I want you to go outside and try this. Uh, if you really want a fun time, it's toward the summer and you have these big thunderstorms. <laughs> just go out there and just let it soak you. And, sh and it starts to change the way you respond to rain. Because our typical response to rain is what? <laughs> Run inside. Don't get wet kind of thing. And I get, I get it. Sometimes we don't need to get soaked. I was at a <clears throat> we were at my son's birthday party last fall at our cousin's house. They have a swimming pool in their backyard. It's August. Saturday afternoon. We're swimming, everything's great, and the clouds roll in, and it starts to rain. And we all start to get out. And then I think, why are we getting out? <laughs> is, is there so any we lightning? Get, is it so we don't get wet? <laughs> There's no lightning, right? I checked. Okay. I said, now if there were lightning, I, I said this to my kids, if there's lightning, we need to get out. But do we need to get out if it's raining? Like, we're here getting wet, right? It's not like it was a heated pool. So it's the same temperature as the rain. And it was an interesting experience because you realize, yeah, this is normally something that I run from, but it's changing the way I interact with it. An hour or two later, we see some lightning in the distance, we're out. Because sometimes you've got to be smart. But if you change the way you interact with something like the weather, it can be 
It was a really neat way to practice this. Uh, I worked with a patient uh, a long time ago who worked in, in the oil fields in Wyoming. And this is where they're out drilling for oil year round. You work a 12 hour shift, um, <clears throat> two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, two weeks off. Tough, tough work. And uh, so if you can imagine being in the middle of Wyoming in January, when it's, you know, five degrees outside, then a wind chill of maybe minus 20, minus 30, for a 12 hour shift. And this guy would talk about how he'd spend the whole day trying not to be cold. And I said, but were you cold anyway? He said, yeah. And to be fair, I've worked at these the same places I grew up in one. I've been out there on the farm and worked in construction, so I know how cold it can get. And I said, what if you just realize that, yes, I'm cold, and you need to do things to keep yourself from dying, like wearing warm clothes and things, but not the tensing up, trying not to be cold all day. Just kind of say, you know what, I'm cold, let's just keep working. Change your response to the stressor, and somehow it affects us a little bit less, because there's not the extra freaking out. So the next time it's windy or cold or rainy, you can try this. Just do the shoulder thing. In fact, that's the thing I do to try to remind myself to just kind of let my shoulders droop. Because for whatever reason, I just tense them up. I just kind of drop them down a little bit. And if you do it right now, just notice how bringing your shoulders down a little bit just takes some of that tension out of it. It doesn't make the stressor go away, but it, it changes our response to it. <clears throat> So that's the first coping skill. What was it? Letting go. Letting go of the struggle. Second one is this idea of adding to the picture. This picture right here has all the answers. So I'll let you look at it for a minute, see if you can figure out what, are, what the answer is to this stress. Pretending it's not there. <laughs> or humans aren't in danger. Aren't in danger? Hmm. Now she's consciously uncoupling, as they call it. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> These are good guesses. You don't see the whole picture. You don't see the whole picture? So you can't, you see her fingers, for example, but not the hand that's holding up the cup. Okay. Okay. Hey. Anybody feel like a guy? What if She's I putting on this? a happy face. What if I show you this? Can you find Emma up there? Yeah. 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 See her? Yeah. Back. Yeah. So now what in the world are we talking about here? You notice how just by adding to the picture, you're not so focused on little details like aren't the dangerous or whatever? As I showed you this, you, you notice she kind of focused in on details that all of a sudden when you step back a little bit, don't seem to matter as much. Here's the classic human thing. You have a problem, what do you do? You focus on the problem. And what, are the, what happens when you focus tighter on the problem? It makes even small things get big. <laughs> to be honest, this has nothing to do with this movie. <laughs> but you thought it did for a minute until we started to add more stuff to the picture. <clears throat> and this is, the, this is where we have this thing called a paradox, where the right thing to do is, seems, is, seems like it's the opposite of what you feel like you should do. Uh, what's a good example of that? Anybody ski? No skiers. Yeah. One or two. So if you ski down these really steep hills, the natural tendency is to lean back because you don't want to fall on your face. But if you lean back, going down a hill, what happens? You don't have your weight on your skis, which means you lose control and you usually come off your skis. So you fall. To make it down a hill and stay in control, you actually have to lean down the hill. It feels totally wrong. And it takes a little bit of faith to do it. But as you start to get it, then you can make it. <clears throat> so sometimes when you have a stressor, adding to the picture instead of focusing tighter on it is the solution. I mean, who would think that? i got a stressor, I need to just clear the decks and focus exclusively on the stress. Isn't that what we do? We've got a busy day, all of a sudden a stressor shows up, 
everything's off the table, I gotta focus on this. And then it starts to make things that were small much bigger than they should be. Sometimes to make it, put it in perspective, so to speak, we add to the picture. What if we add a little bit more? What do you see here? Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin. Who's Charlie Chaplin for the younger folks in the audience? <laughs> Not that the older folks know, should know him because they were alive back then. <laughs> Who's Charlie Chaplin? Actor. Actor. Probably one of our first big movie um, stars. Um, yeah. So what's what's what is this picture made of here? All the other pictures. Yeah. Pictures of what? These are yeah, movie stars. covers. So it's kind of a neat picture to see a picture of Charlie Chaplin made out of movie covers. A movie star made up of movie stars. Can you find Anna? Okay, so what's Emma's role in this picture? A small piece. She's just a piece, right? Her, her job is really to create some white space on the forehead. That's it. But what was her role back here? We were looking for anything we could find to figure out what role she played. So sometimes, when something is problematic, let's say that Emma is a stressor, we step back and we add a few things to the picture, we start to change not only how she looks, but how she functions. And by function, I mean, here, she dominated the scene. We were looking for any way that she could help us understand stress. But here, she's just a little bit of white space, and that's really the only role she plays. So by adding to our experience, adding to our vision, adding to our perspective, it makes things that seem difficult, hard to deal with, it puts them in perspective. So this is starting to answer your question of earlier, which is, but how do we do it when they're so overwhelming? When they're so overwhelming, they're like this. And sometimes when they're so overwhelming, our natural reaction is to get even closer to it. Like this. Like, here's my problem. I just got to get up to it. And that's all I can see. But when you step back from it, it makes it look very different. It looks different, and it changes how it functions. Let's say that this represents something like an obsession. Or a worry about a family member and their OCD. It just seems to dominate our thoughts all day. And yes, it's justified to worry about it. Yes, your obsession is part of the OCD. But perhaps, instead of focusing more on it, we start to add more to our experience, where at least it takes its place among our experience. Not the only thing in our experience. So how do you add more pictures, then? You can literally try this. You can take whatever it is that's getting to you, and write on a piece of paper, and then set it down, and then look at the larger the room. There's a lot more things there. I mean, I could take a stressor, set it right there on the chair, and I can see it, but then I can also see all these people in the room. It makes things look a little bit different. I told you I was in Washington this weekend. One of my favorite things about travel is that it has this effect of helping you kind of step back or step out of things. Sometimes we get so stuck in our day-to-day -day lives and all the worries about bills and houses and money and problems and work and kids and all that stuff. And you kind of step out of it for a few days and you realize it kind of puts that stuff in perspective. <clears throat> One of the great ways you can add to the picture is by getting more knowledge, more education. That's what you're doing here tonight. When you hear more things, learn more things, get more information, then there's more stuff on the table in front of you. If there's only one thing you know about your problem, that's the only thing you've got to look at. But if you know a hundred things about the problem, there's much more pictures there to put it into context. That's why education works so well. Sometimes in therapy, one of the most important things is to help people understand what's going on. For family members and people that struggle with OCD, often there's just this huge relief when you finally understand what this is. What it's called, why it does it, what you can do about it. It starts to put it in a little compartment amongst the larger picture of your life. It's not the only thing that you are. It's that you go from being a crazy person to a person with OCD. Listen to that phrase, a person with OCD, implying that you are a person 
and OCD is part of your experience, but it's not all of your experience. And I think that's one thing I want to emphasize the most. As much as it may seem to take over for your life, it's not the only thing that you are. There are more, there's more to you than that. There's more pictures on the table. Even if you don't focus on them as much, they're still there. You heard this word mindfulness? <clears throat> it has lots of purposes, lots of uses. But this is one of my favorite ways to use it, which is to add more pictures. Sometimes people understand mindfulness to mean, let's pay closer attention to what I'm struggling with. And people don't like that so much. Okay, let's sit down for 30 minutes and pay attention to my anxiety. I just spent all day trying to avoid my anxiety. Why do I have to pay attention to it for 30 minutes? But the idea of mindfulness is to pay attention to your whole experience. A good way is to just go through the five senses and say, okay, what am I experiencing right now through all five senses? Sounds, vision, smell, taste, and touch. And all of a sudden you become aware of many more things that you're experiencing instead of just maybe one stressor that's really consuming you. What if we were to add some positive activities to the day or to the week? And here's where this usually breaks down for people. People will say, go do something positive, go do some th something fun. And what do we expect it to do? We expect it to make the stressor go away. We expect, we expect it to make the OCD go away. But what if we looked at it as, as something that the OCD is here, the stressor is here, and I'll add these positive activities around it. They may not do anything to the OCD or the stressor. In fact, let's not burden them with that. Let's just add them to the picture so they make the stressor look different. That's, that's the big thing I really try to work with patients on, is don't let your favorite things be burdened by trying to make your OCD or your stress go away. They may not do that. You'll see people who will always turn to music every time they need to make their anxiety go away. And then it, you know, so then music becomes associated with anxiety, even though they like music in the first place. And then it doesn't really work because the anxiety still stays there. And so then they're like, they start to hate music because not only does it not make the anxiety go away, but now they think of anxiety every time they listen to music. And so something that was positive for them gets burdened by this. Think about it in a different way, just like we did with Emma. Stress, but then I add music, and a walk, and go watch a movie, and they're on the table, but Emma stays there. And we start to put all those things there, it starts to make the original stress look different, and functional. And those extra activities don't take on that extra burden. Exercise, same thing but I make it a separate one because it has so many extra benefits. But don't burden it with the struggle. Remember the struggle we talked about before? When you're struggling trying to escape, exercise isn't fun when it's burdened by struggling with anxiety or stress or OCD. It's just something that you do. It adds to the picture and it can change how this stuff functions. Just scheduling things, putting a structure in your life. I work a lot with people who struggle with perfectionism. Sometimes one of the things that I'll do is we'll add more things to their plate. What effect would that have? Can't focus so much on one thing. Yeah. Yep. They need more things to do so that things can't become too important. In fact, that's a phrase I often hear a lot with OCD. Thoughts become too important. Experiences become too important. It's more important than they deserve. So sometimes to make things seem less important, instead of trying to squish down that thing, you just leave it alone and add a bunch of other stuff and it makes that one thing look different. This is the power of context. When you can't change a thing, like a stress or an OCD thought or anxiety or whatever, but you can add things around it. And as you well know, it's hard to push the lead up here, but you can easily add things. Relationships. One more way that you can add more pictures. Don't burden the relationships with the struggle. Just add them so they start to make the struggle look different. So let's review a little bit. I promised you two coping skills. Letting go and adding to the picture. Um, how are you going to practice letting go? Walk in the rain. Yep. Okay. Or the cold or whatever it happens to be. You probably try it tonight. I have a feeling it's a little chilly. 
And then adding to the picture, how could you practice that? Step back. Step back. Add more things to your plate. Add more things to your schedule. Do more things. It may not directly impact the thing you're struggling with, but it changes how it looks. Remember what had happened to Emma. Remember how focused you were on details that seemed so unimportant now. So add more things to the picture. Okay? So, <clears throat> uh, one more thing you could try with that. You feel like you're up close to something. Take out a piece of paper and write on it what you're struggling with. Whatever stressor it is, what worry, and you know, how obsessive thought you may have. Just hold it right up to your face. So it's the only thing you can see. And then just try to live like that. Okay? Yeah, go try to make some coffee. Go try to cook breakfast. Try to take a shower. But isn't that what it's like? When that stuff really gets to you, it's like you can just barely function. Because it's right there. And it's this idea of just pull it back in your face a little bit. It's still there. You can still see it but you can also see everything else. And by putting it in context, it takes its place, it changes how it functions. So give those things a try, tonight if you can. And uh, make sure to keep your tanks full and your batteries charged. But as you focus on struggling and battling OCD, so if you're a friend or a family member, so you can be there to support them. Because you need your tanks to be full. There's going to be stressors, they're going to be there. And uh, just be careful not to waste your energy struggling with the stressors so you can save your energy for what you need it for. Um, and you're all here right now working on that. <coughs> My guess is, is that many of you have had stressors in your head while we talked. And <coughs> this, is this, this is why I'm giving you this skill, so that when you're here at something like this, when you go to the support group afterwards, when you go work on whatever it is you're going to work on tonight, tomorrow, that you can be as more present and more there really keep your energy where it needs to be. So thanks for your time. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.